Well, why don't we wait for the bells? <laughs> <laughs> Let's open to page number 108. My father planned it all on that first verse. As soon as we get it up on the screen if you need it. That's right. All right, here we go. What though the way be lonely and dark the shadows fall, I know where'er it leadeth. My father planned it all. I sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned it all. There may be sunshine tomorrow. Shadows may break and flee. Twill be the way he chooses. My father's plan for me. I sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent. My father plans it all. He guides my faltering footsteps along the weary way. For well he knows the pathway will lead to endless day. I sing for I can, the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. <clears throat> I sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned it all. On that last verse, a day of light and gladness on which no shade will fall. Tis this at last awaits me. My father planned it all. I sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent. My father planned it all. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless us tonight, encourage our hearts, and strengthen us with what you have in store as we go through and study Galatians. I pray that you would just guide us and be with the teenagers as they're meeting downstairs and uh, others who are traveling and maybe some still coming on their way. I pray that you would bless and encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. All right, how about page number 75 before we get started in the sermon tonight. <coughs> the God of the Impossible. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. I don't know how God hangs the world on nothing or how he keeps the planets each in place. I can't explain sunshine the seashore, nor can I count the stars that float in space. 
But God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it, but God in heaven cares for me. I don't know how the Lord can save a sinner, or how His grace can cleanse and set him free. I can't explain the mystery of Calvary, to think that Jesus died for even me. But God can do what seems impossible, God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it, but God in heaven cares for me. On that last verse, I don't know all the meaning of forever, or just how long it's been since time began. I can't explain how Christ, who is eternal, could come to earth and die for sinful man. But God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind can never comprehend it. But God in heaven cares for me. All right, good singing today. <clears throat> We're going to look at Galatians today, continuing through our sermon series on Galatians, taking it verse by verse. And today we're looking at the family of God. Just a few verses here, chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. If you need a, a copy of the notes, they're back on the offering box back in the back. <clears throat> When talking of, anytime we talk about family, I found nowadays that uh, you get a mixture of emotions coming up, uh, depending on what your experience with family is. Uh, sometimes people uh, grew up in a single parent home with no father, and they have a hard time relating to a father, uh, to the heavenly father. God is supposed to be, uh, our, us men are supposed to be the example of what the heavenly father is, is uh, but we fail, don't we? Uh, we come short. And uh, so uh, we don't perfectly exemplify what God the Father is. Uh, but sometimes there is an abusive home. And so whenever they think of family, they think of that. Uh, sometimes they had a great family. And so someone, whenever they think of family, they think great thoughts and what a comfort and home and such. Uh, I, but everybody is a little bit different, I think. And, uh, you know, everything has different thoughts about family. I heard about a uh, little boy, uh, I, I, actually they, the, a man was given a, uh, talking about what happened in his home. He said what, uh, he had just finished tucking five kids into bed when three-year-old Billy began to wail and cry. It turns out he had accidentally swallowed a penny and was sure that he was going to die. Uh, desperate to calm him down, he's, uh, this Man, he palmed a penny in it, uh, that he had in his pocket and pretended to pull it out of Billy's ear. Uh, and Billy was delighted to hear that you know this he could get it out of his ear and was okay now. But before the father could uh, react, uh, the boy snatched the penny out of his father's hand and swallowed it and demanded, "Do it again." <laughs> and there are all kinds of things happen at home, don't they? Uh, I heard one lady that said uh, that she decided that she wanted to die, when she died, she wanted to be buried next to Krispy Kreme. Uh, that way she would at least know that her daughter-in-law would visit me there. And, uh, you know, and such. And, you know, you never know uh, what you're going to get. And family is a mixed bag, isn't it? Uh, and all kinds of different situations happen. But regardless of the quality of our relationships uh, with our earthly family here, we can always know and be thankful that we have an inheritance in Christ. And whether we can truly relate to what that's really like uh, because of our experiences here on earth, we know that our Heavenly Father is perfect. And even we may not be able to fully understand what it's like, but we will one day, amen? And uh, we know that we have a Father who loves us 
and who will be just in all that he does. Uh, because he is perfect. Here in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, let's read that together. The Bible says in verse 26, For ye are the children of God by faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For as many of, of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, <clears throat> for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <coughs> so we see, first of all, let, let, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get too far down the line here. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless tonight. Help us as we study this uh, few short verses. I pray that you would just encourage our hearts with what we study. I pray that you would bless us. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Uh, first thing that I want you to see is uh, f that we have been invited to a family. Roman number one. Am I going to control this? You got it. Okay. Uh, Roman number one there. We have been invited to a family. Verse number 26 tells us that. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, how do we know that we are justified by faith and not by the law, by doing the best that we can? This is what we've been talking about in Galatians. And it's the law versus grace. It's law versus faith. Doing what we can and getting by or trusting in the faith that we have in Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when we have faith, the Bible tells us that God makes us His children. And because we are made the children of God and because the Holy Spirit testifies that we are the children of God, we can have confidence that faith brings us to that point. Jesus brings us face to face with God. He stirs God to adopt us and make us His children. How? By faith, He says here. What does he say? For ye are all the children of God by what? Faith. It's not that we have earned it. We cannot earn it. We can't be good enough to become the children of God. I can't be good enough to become Jimmy and Kathy Wallace's son. <laughs> I am born into that family. We are born into the family of God through faith and by faith. Uh, there are a couple things I want to point out when we're speaking of God the Father. First of all, letter A there. God is the Father of all creation. Now that's not what we're talking about here in this verse. But there is a point that God is the Father of all creation. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 tells us, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. But just because God is the Father of all creation, it doesn't mean that God is the spiritual Father of all. He is not the Father of all people redemptively. And so not all people are going to be going to heaven, only those who are the children of God. And so we see, first of all, that God is the Father of all creation, but God is the spiritual father of the saved. He is the spiritual father of the saved. Uh, he says here in verse 26, For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We can only become the spiritual children of God if we have that faith in Christ Jesus. We see, first of all, number one underneath that, Before Christ, we were the children of wrath. Before Christ, we were the children of wrath. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, "...among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh and of the mind, where, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as, of, uh, as others." By nature, by the moment we're born, we are the children of wrath. But through Christ, number two, through Christ, we are the children of God. Because of what Christ has done for us, Christ, Father, God the Father becomes our spiritual Father. John 14, verse 6 tells us, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And many people today will say, well, that's your truth. My truth is something else. I'm sorry that that's not true. There is no relative truth. It's either truth or it's untruth, one or the other. Now, you may have an opinion, and that's your opinion, and this is my opinion. That may be true, but there's only one truth. And my opinion may line up with the truth, or it may line up with the untruth. But just because it's my opinion doesn't mean it's automatically the truth, although we like to think that, don't we? <laughs> 
But the truth is, there is only one truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. No man can come to the Father through any other means but through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. A person who is not trusted in Christ is not a child of God. God has no sons who are not identified by faith with His only Son, Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through His Son. John 1.12 tells us, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. So it's only those who have received Jesus Christ are they who have the power to become the sons of God. The point is this, the person who tries to become acceptable to God by the law, by doing the best that you can, by keeping the rules, if you will, the man who focuses upon the law and good works, that man keeps his mind upon the law and struggles to be good. God is not the center of his focus. He's not the center of his thoughts. He's not the center of his life. The law and the good works are the center of his life. Faith causes us to focus on God's Son, Jesus Christ. He becomes the center of our life because we know we have no hope to keep the law well enough. We have to trust in Jesus Christ and only He can save us. Man can rest upon this one thing. God will accept anyone who focuses upon His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the only thing that's going to get us there. And then the third thing that we need to see is that by the Holy Spirit, we are adopted children. Before Christ, we were the enemies of God. We were children of wrath. And through Christ, we are the children of God. And by the work that He did, and by faith, and only by Him, He is the way, the truth, and the life. We can become the children of God. And then the Holy Spirit is involved as well. And the Holy Spirit comes in and seals us. He enables us to become the adopted children of God. Galatians chapter 4, a little bit later. We'll look at these verses a little bit later. But he says, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit comes in us, and we have the ability then to cry unto the Heavenly Father as if we were crying to a personal relationship of a father. This word Abba, it's the akin to the word daddy or something like that that we would use. An endearing name, a, a close name. A lot of people have a hard time comprehending that kind of relationship with the Heavenly Father because they never had that kind of relationship with their father. But this is a close relationship and the Holy Spirit that lives within us enables us and to be able to have that close relationship with Him. Romans 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We can have confidence that we are the children of God because the Holy Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit and gives us that confidence. I talked about before how I had prayed whenever I was a young boy. I don't know, probably four or five. And uh, I remember being at the kitchen table and I remember doing something, <laughs> but I don't really much about it. But I remember getting baptized. Uh, and then around second grade or so, I remember talking to my parents again. But I don't really remember anything about it. And I remember getting baptized. <laughs> that was a traumatic one. That's a different that's a story for a different time. But uh, I definitely remember that baptism. Uh, but whenever I was 13 years old or 12 years old, I came to the realization that I had never really trusted Christ for myself. I had relied on what my parents told me, and I believed my parents, but I didn't believe Jesus. I had trusted in my good works, and I would work to do good, and I had gone to church faithfully, and I had worked at the church to do things that I could around the church as a young teenager and such, and young adult. And I would, after school, I would go down to the church and try to help pastor with anything I could. This was before my dad, or uh, in between pastorates with my dad. And I, I would do... A, good as much as I could. I even went soul winning and told other people how to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I myself wasn't saved. And at 12 years old, I came to the realization that it has to be my faith, not my parents' faith. And I remember leaning over to my dad and telling him, I'm not saved. And it was a Wednesday night. I, I'm not saved. And I knew I wasn't. 
And he didn't question me. He didn't uh, do anything. He just said, okay, let's go. <laughs> it was invitation time. So we went down to the altar and knelt there. And he said, you know what to do, do it. And I did know what to do. I just had never done it for myself. And so I knelt there and I said, Lord, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Knew I was a sinner. Asked him to forgive me. Accepted him as my Savior. I had been plagued with doubts all of those years. But I kept pointing back to, but I've been baptized. In fact, I've been baptized twice. <laughs> I must be saved. But the doubts kept coming at me. But after that moment, whenever I knelt there and I prayed for myself and I accepted Christ as my Savior and it became my faith, I never once, never since, have I doubted my salvation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit then lived within me and testified to me and bore witness that I was the child of God. Whenever we are truly saved, now the devil may bring things and may try to cause doubt, but when we are spirit-filled and whenever we are, have the Holy Spirit in us, he bears witness with us that we are the child of God. So, number one, invited to a family by God. Second thing I want you to see is that we are identified with the Savior then. Through that family, through the, what He has done, we are now identified with Him. Verse 27 and verse, 20, verse 28, it says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We are identified with Him through baptism. We're showing everyone we're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. and We're not ashamed to show everyone that we have accepted Christ. And Now that is not the point of baptism. The bapti point of baptism is to be obedient. God tells us to do it, and so we're to do it. But the byproduct of it is to show people that we have accepted Christ and we are identifying with Him. Uh, is Paul saying here, look at verse 27 again, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Is he saying that baptism is what saves them? No, he's not saying that. But he's using the identification, the thing that shows everyone, the outside, we can't see my heart. You can't see my heart, but you can see my obedience. And he's saying, any thinking person, honest person knows that there are thousands and thousands of people who have been baptized and yet still live like the devil themselves. No, it's not baptism that saves you. It's that faith in Jesus Christ that's going to save you. No work is going to save you. So Paul could not mean that it is baptism that causes God to clothe a person with Christ, as he says here. No, similarly, any honest thinking person knows that there are thousands of people who profess faith and yet live like the devil himself. So it's not just the professing of faith that does it. It's the belief of the heart and believing in their heart that Christ has saved them, has died for them and risen again for them. So Paul could not mean that the general public, uh, what the general public means by faith, just a general idea of belief. In fact, he tells us that the devils believe and tremble, but they're not saved. What Paul is saying is what Scripture declares, a true believer does what God tells them to do, including baptism. By their fruit you shall know them. Now does that mean that the Christian... The true Christian will always do everything that God tells them to do? Well, no, we can all say that that's not true, amen? We can all say that, but the general aspect of our life is saying we are living obedient to Christ. Our obedience shows our faith. I know people who have even been baptized years and years and years later. I, I, I knew of a lady, and before I came along and met her, my pastor talked about how that uh, she wouldn't be baptized, and she refused to get baptized for years and years. And as it came out, she was terrified of water. And she was terrified. She nearly drowned when she was a kid, and she was terrified of water. And he talked to her, and he said, listen, he said, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to, if you want to be obedient, because she was tr struggled with it and really knew she wanted, needed to be baptized, and she wanted to obey, but she was terrified. And finally, he just talked to her and said, you need to have faith. You need to trust that the Lord will help you through this and give you the courage to do this. And uh, he walked through and told her exactly what would happen and, and even practiced with her on dry land <laughs> and, uh, and different things and stuff. And, she, and he left it in her hands and said, this is a decision you have to make. And whatever you decide is what you're going to decide. And uh, a while later, she came to him. She says, I'm going to do it. 
I'm still not ready, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> and she went in and she was baptized and, and uh, she was so glad that she did. But so baptism doesn't save you. I have a wedding ring on my finger. If I take off my wedding ring, does that mean that I'm not married anymore? No. It's just a symbol of my wedding, of my marriage. If I, can, if I were to never get married, but I saw a, a wedding ring at the store, and I said, oh, that's a nice ring. I'm going to put that on. Does that make me married? No. It's just a symbol showing everybody that I am married to my wife, Michelle. And I want to wear that ring. I don't want to be without it. I, every once in a while, something will happen. I take off. I hardly ever take off my ring. But every once in a while, I take it off and I set it aside or I lose it. I, I, when I lost weight, I, I flung my, my hand and my ring flew off somewhere. I couldn't find it. And it, it bothered me not to have my ring on me. It just drove me nuts. I want everyone to know I'm taken, you know, because I have to beat them off with a stick if I'm not careful, you know. You, know, you didn't have to laugh at that. <laughs> no, but... Uh, no, it, but I want everyone to know, I am my wife's. I belong to someone. And baptism is the same thing. If we, if we get baptized, we're saying, I belong to Jesus. And I want to be happy to show forth that truth. But it doesn't save you. Baptism is just the first and immediate evidence of that faith. Therefore, faith and baptism are closely linked. And so closely that Paul can speak of baptism as faith. Truth be told, what he may be saying even more is that this baptism is not the literal baptism of water, but rather a baptism or an immersion into the character of Christ himself. That he show forth the character of Christ by putting on Christ as he says here. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. It's a renewal, it's a rebirth, a work of grace, not of self-effort, but we're allowing Christ to do it through us through faith. Either way, we're identified with Christ, first of all, through his, in His position, letter A. We're identified in His position, verse 27 again here. We are baptized into Christ. The phrase, put on Christ here at the end there, refers to a change of garments, the a uh, believer has laid aside the dirty garments of sin. In fact, Isaiah 4, 64 verse 6 says, But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind hath taken us away. We're all sinners. Even our goodness, our righteousness, is just filthy rags in comparison to Christ and His true righteousness. But by faith, we have received the robes of righteousness of Christ. So we see in, like in Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 8, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. All those things that are the sin, we put those things off. We take those garments off. We lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man and his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even if a man have a quarrel against any. As Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful." So we have the idea of putting off of the old garments, the old man, and the ways that the old man did, and putting on Christ. Living the way that Christ would live if he were on this earth. With kindness, with long-suffering. Our works do not get us to salvation, and it does not keep us saved, but it is the evidence that salvation is truly in our hearts. The phrase put on in the Greek is enduo. It, it means to sink into is the literal meaning of it. 
to put on or clothe oneself. We put on Christ. The way that we live is filtered through Him. Everything we do is filtered through yielding to the Holy Spirit. Would Christ do this? I love the book, In His Steps. If you've never read that book, I would highly recommend it. Sheldon, I don't remember the last, first name. Charles Sheldon, it's not, that's not right. But uh, In His Steps is a great book. And it's where, the, where it originally came the phrase, what would Jesus do? And the church comes and the, a homeless man comes in and the church doesn't treat him quite well. And the pastor is convicted by it and he goes and studies out and, and uh, uh, searches his heart and searches the Lord's heart about it. And he comes before the church and he says, I want everyone to make a pact with me. And if you're willing to, would you meet me over in this room over here and we'll commit to the Lord to do one thing. That is every decision we make, we will, before we make the decision, we will stop and ask, what would Jesus do? And if you'll make that commitment with me, would you meet over in this room? We'll pray and commit ourselves to the Lord. And they did. And God changed the whole community through this church. It's a great book if you ever get a chance to read it. But if we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? We are living our life through Him. We have put Him on. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 tells us, Paul lives this way. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is Christ that's living in us. When we yield ourselves to him, we are putting on Christ. But not only are we identified with Christ in his position, but also in our practice, letter B. Because we are in Christ, we put on Christ. You know, someone who puts on an army uniform doesn't necess isn't necessarily in the army. Just because you have the uniform doesn't mean you're in the army. Someone who is in the army, it, uh, but so, someone who is in the army, if they do not put on the army uniform, I, I'm not saying that right. <laughs> Let me see if I can say, see what I actually wrote down. Oh, uh, I know what I was trying to say here. I didn't word it quite right in my notes. But what I was trying to say is uh, someone puts on the army uniform because they are, if they are in the army, they put on the uniform to identify themselves. That's what I was trying to say. I, boy, that, that was a struggle. That was not worth that, all that effort. Uh, but to put on, it, it, it's this word here that are, uh, this, here we have it in verse number 27. It says, to be baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. This, this word here, it's in the middle voice. It, it's the meaning that the action is being performed by the person upon himself. It's the, you're doing it. You're putting on Christ. The putting on of a coat may be done by the person himself. And this is the same thing as putting on Christ. It's something we are actively to do. Putting on Christ requires that we separate from the worldliness because we can't put on the world and put on Christ at the same time. We have to take off the old, put off the old, and put on the new. It's a decision we have to make to purposely live that way. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, warns that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And this warning is given to be different than the rest of the world. We need to be put off the things of this world and the darkness of this world, and we need to put on Christ so that we can be those shining lights that we're supposed to be. Putting on Christ cannot mix with the things of this world. No faith, faith clothes us in Christ, clothes us with His righteousness, clothes us with His works, and He works through us as we just yield ourselves to Him. Christ is the very embodiment of righteousness. And so when we put Him on and yield to Him, we have no choice but to do what's right. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are only hope of righteousness we have is yielding to him and what he has done for us. Therefore, when we put on Christ, we put on his righteousness. 
That has nothing to do with us, really. All we're doing is making the decision to go forward. I, I remember in, my pastor used to talk about in California, he used to talk about all the time that there was a man who frustrated him every time pastor would say, uh, make, it's time to make a decision for Christ and we need to make a decision to accept Christ as a Savior. He'd come to him and he said, uh, it's none of us. It's not, nothing that we can do. And, and so you kind of quit saying that because it's, it's all Christ and we can't do anything to get saved. It's all Christ. And, and, but the truth is we have to make the decision to yield. We have to make the decision to accept that gift of, li of life. But all the rest is up to him. All it is is giving up and letting him do the rest. Not holding back, not fighting, not choosing to go against him. And it's the same thing not only for salvation, but it's the same thing for having a yielded, spirit-filled life. Stop fighting the Holy Spirit. Yield to him. Put on Christ. Everything we try to do in our own righteousness, our own works, is just filthy rags. True righteousness only comes through Christ. And when we're clothed with Christ, we're clothed with righteousness. When the Father sees us, He sees His Son. The Bible says in John 1.12, But as many as have received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. We looked at that verse a few minutes ago. But that's what, how God the Father can see us, because of what He did for us in our acceptance of Him. Seeing this, it's, High time that Christians get serious about this thing of serving the Lord. Not living just part-time Christianity. Not living one way on Sunday and living another way Monday through Friday and, well, Saturday too. But get serious about this thing, about yielding to the Holy Spirit and every single day living the way that Christ wants us to live. Romans chapter 13, Paul writing to the, the Romans, he says... And that knowing this, knowing the time, knowing that Christ could come at any moment, knowing what Christ wants to do in His church, now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Christ's coming is coming closer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly in the day, not in rioting or not drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Putting on Christ also involves us accepting all those whom the Lord accepts. Amen. The Bible says here in verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Our nation right now is divided. And people are doing all they can to divide us even more. And they're divide, dividing down race lines, they're dividing down political lines, they're dividing down religious lines, they're dividing down every line that they can and trying to destroy the relationship of everyone. But being in Christ and putting on Christ leaves no room for prejudice. We are all one. I don't care what race you are, I don't care what political view you have, you might be wrong about that, but nevertheless, you're not, it's, a, it's not about your political view, it's not about anything else. It's about whether or not you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and are you a child of God? We had a lady in California in our church, <clears throat> and she had come from L.A., and she had a few different ideas than we did. <laughs> and she was very outspoken about her political views, and they were very contrary to the vast majority of all the others in the church. And it was a very trying time to teach what the Bible says about issues that come up in political issues but yet at the same time loving her and letting her feel welcome in a church even if we don't agree politically with what she says. It can be a real challenge. But we're to, no, bitter, uh, no prejudice has any place in the house of God. 
Jesus is the answer to all prejudice. Jesus is the answer to all bitterness and all hatred, all oppression, all inequalities of the earth. Jesus is the answer for all of it. Christ made us all one, he says here in this verse. Every believer stands on equal footing before Jesus Christ, the footing of faith. Romans 10, verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon Him. I don't understand how someone can be a Christian and believe some of the things that some people believe. However, that's not my place to do. I can teach them what the Word of God says, and I can teach them biblical principles, but beyond that, I have to let them make their own decisions according to how the Holy Spirit, and hope, pray that the Holy Spirit convicts them to make the right decisions. Until then, my job is to love them, amen? My job is to try to help them in any way that I can. Pray for them. Romans 12, 5 says, So we being many are one in Christ, and everyone members one of another. We need to not let anything divide our church, amen? This is not a social club. This is not a political club. You may have a different opinion than someone else. We need to put that aside, amen? And we need to have our faith in Jesus Christ and trust it. I don't understand why everyone doesn't believe the same way I do. If they only knew I was right about everything, it would, it would all be happier, amen? No. The truth is we don't know what we're wrong about or else we'd change it, amen? We just have to keep doing what the Lord convicts us to do. Keep searching His Word so that we can change what we find is wrong. But keep loving people and keep helping them grow. So, we are invited to a family. And as such, we are identified with a Savior. And now, number three, we are included in the promise. Verse 29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A couple of things to remember about this promise. We are included in the promise. First of all, we see letter A, the promise concerning Christ. This promise that it's talking about, it's talking about Abraham's seed. Here in verse 29, it's referring to Christ. It's not the seeds of Abraham. It's not the lineage of Abraham, but the one focus that was given to him was the seed, Christ, Jesus. The phrase, and if ye be Christ, follows what Paul said at the end of verse 28. It says, at the end of verse 28, it says, For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. This sums up the common position we all have in Christ. Whether Jew, whether Greek, no matter what, male, female, it doesn't matter. We are all one in Christ if we have trusted Him. Second thing I want you to notice here, a couple of things I want you to remember. Secondly, the promise for all believers. All believers, without exception, are one in Christ Jesus. Again, it doesn't matter your differences. It only matters that we are all children of God. All spiritual blessings, all resources available to me are available to you. All promises that are available to me are available to you. They're all equally given to all believers who have accepted Christ as their Savior. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon Him. Now Abraham's seed, it refers back to verse number 14, where it says that the blessing of Abraham came to the Gentiles as promised in the last part of the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3 talks about this. It says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Verse 14 says, This promise was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And then the end of verse 14 there, going back to a couple weeks ago, tells us that the promise of this was so that the Gentiles would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The purpose of Jesus Christ's coming was that we, all, Jew or Gentile, all believers, would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Our Christian lives take on new wonder and meaning 
if we would just realize that we have what we have in Christ. If we would realize that all of it is by grace, not keeping of the law, not doing good enough, not trying to get by well enough, but it's all by grace, it's all through faith. We are the sons and daughters of God's family, heirs of God. Are we drawn on our inheritance now? The Holy Spirit is our down payment, it's our earnest of our inheritance, of what we'll have one day. Are you drawing on that inheritance by living a spirit-filled life today? You know, I think some of us will probably go into culture shock when we get into heaven. But really, if we live the spirit-filled life here on earth, we could live a wonderful life here. Oh, it won't be perfect. We'll have trials. We'll have struggles. But with God leading us every step of the way and putting off the things of this world and putting on Christ, He helps us make those decisions the right way in the first place. Amen? Next week we're going to look more at the idea that we are children of God through Christ. We'll look at that and will we come to that? I'm sorry, not next week. Next week is Father's Day, so we won't have Sunday night service on Father's Day. I want you to spend time with your uh, family and uh, have a good time together. But when we do, and then I think the next week after that is the missionary. So we won't have, we'll have Sunday night service, but I won't be preaching. And then the week after that, I believe is July 4th. <laughs> so it may be a few weeks before we get to this next verses, but we'll get there. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for this promise that we are the children of God and we have this inheritance in you. Now, Lord, may we live that way. May we yield ourselves to your Holy Spirit, live that Spirit-filled life, yielded to you, searching Scripture so that the, that the Holy Spirit has the ammunition, has the, where, uh, the things to use in our lives to apply it, to enlighten it, and show us the way that you want us to live. May we be faithful to walk with you, I pray. Guide us and direct us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. and pray that you guide us and help us. Help VBS, I pray, in the next few days. Uh, may we be able to reach out into many kids' lives. And I pray that you would do a work in our hearts and help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming tonight.